are it is september 7th 2023 and as i mentioned last week uh because we have these sales coming up in new york i wanted to go through and do uh, sort of a quick video and take a look at what they've got coming along and uh, we're going to talk some more about some of the christie sales that's coming up and the one that i'm going to talk about this morning or this afternoon is the important chinese works of art sale taking first on the 21st and the 22nd of this month it's a couple of weeks away about two weeks off so there's plenty of time to go over and look and what i'm going to do is i will do what i I did before i'm going to go through i went through and i picked out the pieces that i i personally aesthetically like the best because pieces can be academically very very rare but not particularly attractive um and and i I'm, I'm more interested in the art and how well it's done for its type and style than necessarily for its uh, uh maybe its inherent rarity but not a beautiful object and uh, that often can happen. And there are people who love historic objects, things that are inscribed and dated for academic reasons. And I tend, I tend to look at it a little bit more from the aesthetic side. Which things do I like the best? Uh, for example, we're gonna, I'll, I'll pick out the bronze here that I like the best, and, and some of these I don't find any of the jades particularly interesting. Uh, but there's some other objects in here that I find very interesting, and I think they're really attractive. And not all of them are terribly expensive. It's just what I personally like. All right, and uh, you have to go through and make up your own mind, of course, if you're going to participate in these sales. But uh, we'll start with this. This is a really interesting piece. It's a very large uh, uh, a bracket lobed gilt bronze guardian king mirror. And uh, there's a whole write up explaining what these mirrors were for and how they were to uh, drive away evil and so forth. But aesthetically, I just found this to be so fabulously well done. And it's very big. It's about 20 inches in diameter, which is really unusual. It's a mirror, but the quality of the casting, the quality of the casting, the vines, um, the, the, the Dorja in the center crossed, and then the Buddha symbols and, and all this other business in the inscription, I just find it to be so attractive. The back of it is quite simple. Um, that's the reflective side, obviously, uh, with some Sanskrit running around it and so forth. But the front of it, I just found to be absolutely stunning in, in its uh, quality and execution and a uh, uh, highly, highly refined casting. I really, really like this a lot. I think this is a great thing. Uh, it's the kind of thing, if you could only own one one great bronze plaque, um, this would be something worth considering, uh, certainly. And it's big, it's uh, 17 inches across. It's quite large, it has, it's got a history, a Swiss collection that was sold at Christie's back in 2001, about 25 years ago. It's got a big estimate, two to $300,000, and we'll see if it gets there, it wouldn't surprise Surprised me if at all at all if it did because the quality is so good. It's uh, or they date it to the early 15th century, which is sort of right in the smack in the middle of the Ming Dynasty, um, and it's and it's in remarkable condition. So that's something I would I would just adore. Um, and then over to this this bronze is really finely cast ritual food gui, gui or gui. gui, gui Gui, uh, excuse me, for the Western Zhao Dynasty. And what caught my eye about this is is how refined the casting is. When you look at the, the fineness of the casting in this piece, and this beautiful bluish, decidedly bluish green patina, the surface on this is just wonderful. And and the, and the casting is all done mostly, in, and there's some high relief bosses on it and so forth, but a lot of the casting is in very low relief, extremely fine work, um, very detailed, in beautiful condition, and has an undisturbed surface. It's just an elegant, beautiful, simple thing. It, it's not one of those heavily cast cast objects that jumps out at you like some shang pieces or something this is a, a, a bit of a more delicate thing uh it is absolutely
absolutely beautiful. 80 to $120,000 estimate, and uh, it measures nine inches in diameter, so it's about the size of a large Ming incense burner. If you have some of those laying around, give you some idea on the size. And it's got a pretty good history of ownership. It, it came from the, um, uh, uh, sold at Sotheby's in 1973. It was acquired by Marchance um, in London, our friends over there, and then it went to the Far East Gallery in Canada, and then it's been in the Leonard Star Collection, and then by descent, uh, come down through descent within the family. And uh, there's a little bit of writing in there. It's been exhibited a few times in museums. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing. Beautifully cast. Beautifully cast. And then over to this. The, this is a really. This is from a Japanese collection, and it's a Young Lo period Ming Celadon uh, uh, Long Kwan uh, 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 grapes pattern uh, charger. It's 20 inches in diameter, Young Lo period, but it's grapes pattern. And the grapes pattern was quite popular in the Young Lo period on blue and white pieces. Um, and it was such a popular pattern that some, many of them were sent to uh, Turkey and uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the Middle East as tribute gifts to the Khans and the, and the leaders there. And uh, it became so the grapes pattern was so popular, as a matter of fact, that the, the earliest Iznik pottery made in Turkey, that it was, it was inspired by Chinese uh, grapes pattern pieces. But you see them most often in blue and white, and they sell for huge amounts of money. They sell for anywhere from two to, uh, there was one I remember that sold for about five five and a half million dollars in blue and white. But this is a Celadon example and it's 20 inches in diameter. And then curiously, these may be more rare than the blue and white examples. Um, uh, curiously, um, uh, you don't see them in Celadon very often in this size. You see smaller ones sometimes, the grapes on them, but not these, not 20 inches in diameter. Here's the back of it. And not surprisingly, it came from a, uh, a, a an old, ja I believe from an old Japanese collection, collected in Kyoto between 1920 and 1930. There's no other ownership that indicates that it's come down through the family. It's estimated at two to $300,000. And I think it's worth every penny. I think that's actually for what it is, if you consider it, if you go out Googling around and finding other grapes, patterns. I don't know how many you're going to find, but when you consider that a blue and white example is worth two to five million, a good one, and this is a very fine piece of Celadon. The, the green is excellent. Uh, the decoration is very good. It's a rare pattern. It's young low period, and they don't turn up very often. So let, I'll be curious to see how that does. Uh, it could do very well. Who knows? And then this, the Feiwa jar. Feiwa jars turn up all the time. This is a Hongxi example. It had, it had been through a series of pretty good dealers over the years, including Eskenazi, Jinjindo in Tokyo, in a private collection, a private institutional collection in Japan. Uh, but you see Feiwa jars turn up. They were made lots of them in, in the Ming Dynasty, but not many of them are like this one. This one has a gem-like quality to it. Notice how crisp the, the, the casting is, uh, the relief work, how tightly the enamels are applied. There's not a lot of flake. You see lots of flaking and chipping on Feiwa jars because they tend to be fairly porous and the glazes fall off and they got used. This one is just as crisp and, and beautiful as the day it was made. And it was a high quality one at the time it was made. This is not your typical Feiwa jar. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. The decoration is great. The colors are very, very appealing. You have this lovely yellow on here and all these different shades of blue and so forth. And uh, it's about 15 inches in height, I believe, uh, 15 and one eighth inches tall. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, there's an essay down below. You can read up on it. It's estimated at 150 to $250,000, which is a big price for Fei Wah. Um, that's a big estimate, but it's an absolutely superb, uh, pretty much gem quality uh, glaze on it. And I think that'll that'll get it there um, if, it, if it has a chance. And then over to this, the really nice Shunzi, Shunzi period uh, bowl. It's about eight inches and eight and a half inches in diameter. Very attractive, very clean coloring. Really lovely example. This is also from a Japanese collection, I believe, but very unusual pattern. Uh, but meticulously painted in Femi Ver. Really, really like it. And uh, these, as you know, have been doing very, very well lately. So we'll we'll see if it blows through that four to $6,000 estimate. 
And then, uh, let's see here, moving along. Oh, the jarlet, the little water pot. This is nice with trigrams all over the top of it and these uh, herons. It's a pattern you often see during from the Jai Jing period. The colors are classic Jai Jing. Uh, these very, very intense cobalt blues, beautifully painted, uh, a lovely little water pot. This is just a great little example. Not a huge estimate on it, but it's a beautiful, beautiful Markin period piece. And um, it has an exhibition history. It's estimated at just three to five thousand dollars. Comes in its box and all that business, but very, very nice quality. And it's got some ownership history down there. And it's been uh, it was uh, Asia Pacific Museum in Pasadena um, accessioned it in 1998. But a lovely little jar. And if you like Jai Jing Mark and period pieces, and you you you're not in the market for one that costs twenty or thirty thousand dollars, you might want to take a shot at that. That's a nice one. And then over here to this, two very unusual Yongshan period uh, pheasant dishes within leaf cartouches. This really struck me. These were absolutely beautiful. And uh, I believe they were sold by Santos. We'll check at, at the end here. I think it was sold by Santos in London. Uh, but wonderful familial rose decoration in this very unusual, slightly off-center leaf um, with peacocks up, uh, up on craggy rocks and then surrounded by floral borders and honeycomb patterns and all this sort of thing. And they look to be in good condition. I think they're about eight inches in diameter, as I recall, eight and a quarter inches. Oh, they were sold by Chait Gallery. Excuse me. Ralph Chait Gallery in New York sold these. And uh, they're estimated at twenty to $30,000. They get big estimates. They are Yongshen period, obviously. They're a rare pattern. And uh, to a collector, uh, this might be a, a very good buy because it's not a pattern you're going to you're going to find that readily. Um, they uh, they've got some uh, historical museum exhibition histories and so forth. And I don't know if there's much else written about them. There's a number of good young Chen pieces in the sale. There's a ruby back dish that's quite nice. Uh, but these caught my eye because I think they're very, very striking um, with this off center uh, pattern, as I mentioned, and the flowers around the edges and the enameling on them is just absolutely outstanding. Uh, so we'll see where that, they end up. And then this, this is the best piece of blue and white in the sale, um, in my opinion. Uh, it's a 20 inch uh, Chin Lung period uh, charger. And when you pull it in, the quality of the cobalt decoration on the front and the back, we'll get to the back in a second. Uh, but if you look at it, the winged dragon, uh, absolutely meticulously done. The facial expression, the balance of the horns, the way the wings are done, the way the scales are, uh, are outlined in uh, white. And uh, then you have the flaming pearl down here and all of these heaped and piled flowers floating around this beautiful wave border. It's got everything going on it. And remember, it's 20 inches in diameter. This is a big piece of porcelain. There's the back of the plate. And as you can see, the back of it has uh, two dragons on it again. Um, there's the mark. The foot rim looks excellent, nice and rhyme, uh, rounded off and creamy, smooth. And this uh, beautiful cobalt, the cobalt, the thing that this plate, I guess, really has going for it is that the cobalt decoration um, itself, the, the overall artwork is absolutely excellent. The potting is excellent, of course, and the uh, 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 the quality of the cobalt is excellent. So excellent drawing, very tightly drawn, very precisely drawn, perfectly drawn, um, lots of shading in the cobalt, and uh, but a beautiful blue tone, just an absolutely beautiful blue tone. Um, and uh, it looks like it's an outstanding condition. Uh, so we'll see where that ends up. It's got a pretty good, it's got a stiff estimate on it, seventy to $90,000. But it's one of the nicest uh, Chin Lung examples. It's been around in a while, and, and there's no ownership or auction history to it. It just says it's coming out of a private collection in England. Um, and it may be part of, you know, the, 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 the Summer Palace hoard or something like that. Uh, certainly the kind of thing that they would have taken. And then over to this. This is something that uh, struck me. I thought this was absolutely beautiful. Uh, early Qing, very early Qing, late late Ming possibly, early Qing um, uh, lace jar. Uh, and it's it's based it's based there's a, there's a little bit down here. It's based on an Eastern Zhao uh, bronze form. And this is done in cloisonne, which is extremely rare. It was uh, sold a number of years ago by Jim Lally. Uh, but an absolutely stupendously attractive piece of cloisonne work. Um, and, and it looks, and it's got this archaic um, uh, uh, enameling all over it, beautiful gilded relief on it, um, and, the, and these lovely handles. Whoops. Okay. 
little interruption there. Uh, just a great looking piece of cloisonne. Uh, very strout, very strong. It's about 13 inches tall, as I remember. Yeah, 13 inches. And the only history on it, it was sold by Jim Lally. Uh, but he handled great things, and this is a great piece of cloisonne. And if you want something, you know, if you're looking for an absolutely fabulous piece of uh, early Qing cloisonne work, this is among the best. This is really, really good. And uh, it's estimated at 30 to 50,000. I don't know what the uh, the, the reserve is on it uh, or what the opening bid is going to be, but I suspect it'll be close to it. Uh, but very attractive piece of cloisonne work. And then on the on the silks things, there aren't a lot of silks in the sale, uh, but there is this. This is a really fine birthday panel kisi, bit of kisi work. And when you pull it in and you look at it, this is about as fine as kisi work ever gets. Uh, absolutely fine. Great shading, beautiful apricot background. Um, I love the greens and the yellows. All the colors are very, very harmonious on this. Aesthetically, I just find this to be so attractive. You have these Citron Buddha fingers uh, coming down out of the trees, and you have ascending goddesses and all kinds of symbolism going on here. Um, it's like a gathering of, 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 of you know, earthly delights in, in a way. They're out there, the, the double spotted deer on the bridge, uh, the lady with the raft. Um, all these things you can go through and you can look all these characters up in uh, books on, on, on Buddhism and Taoism and uh, figure out uh, who's who and what's what's going on. Uh, but a, a beautiful. There's the, 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 the peach trees, citron uh, fingers, peach trees, ascending herons, ascending uh, goddesses riding on uh, animals and so forth. Just a, a great looking thing. Um, and they call it a birthday panel uh, of a mortal Taoist immortals birthday panel. And it's estimated at twelve to eighteen thousand dollars, which I think is it seems cheap to me given the prices of these things. It's an eighteenth or early nineteenth century piece. The colors make me the colors in the drawing tend to make me think it's more likely eighteenth century. They may just be being safe because it could have been done during the Jai Jing period, I suppose. But absolutely superb quality and in good condition. My God, it looks like it's absolutely perfect. And it's good size. It's, of course, uh, uh, 40 by 66 inches. So it's three feet, three and a half feet wide, roughly, and uh, uh, about a little over five feet tall. So it's a nice big panel. Uh, would hang great. You get a good, a good frame for it and put some UV glass over it. You'll be in good shape. And then on to this. This is uh, one of these fabulous uh, Chillong brush pots. Um, um, how tall is this thing here? Let's see. Uh, eight inches tall, uh, 17th century. And um, you may remember that there was one quite similar to it in uh, the Ellsworth collection and one in the Irving collection. And both of them did very, very well. It's, it's a highly desirable form. Um, um, this was, um, a matter of fact, the one in the Ellsworth collection, I think I read somewhere that was one of his favorite, um, favorite scholars uh, table objects that he ever owned um, it was one of these brush pots. Absolutely beautifully carved. The chimera on it is uh, very meticulously done. Very, very, very nice. Coiling up alongside the branch with the peach on it again. And uh, it looks like it's a good shape. I don't see any damage. Sometimes you see damages and chips along the edges of these because there's, there's an edge here and then there's another edge up there. So you sort of run a double chance of getting it bumped or bruised. And uh, this one looks like it led a pretty charmed life. And it's estimated at thirty-five to $45,000. I suspect it should get there because this, this type of pot always does well. Um, uh, there is, uh, it just came from, all it says is the MC Gallery in uh, Hong Kong on uh, Hollywood Road sold it, um, thirty-five dollars to $45,000. And then over to this, this is a, a well-known type of Southern Sung Celadon that they turn out today. Lots of copies of these around. We see them all the time in the inquiry program. This is a really nice example. Very finely potted, beautiful, even color, perfect green, that nice, nice sort of canuda green as they refer to it. Um, it has the Japanese box and all that business. Nobody cares about the boxes unless they're old ones, but they, they look nice, I guess, next to them. Uh, not a big fan of boxes unless it's unless it's a historic collection box. Uh, but this is a beautifully potted example. Uh, the foot is nice and high. The body is well-rounded, tapers in sweetly into the side, this nice, long, straight neck, and then this very finely done mouth. All of the potting on this is excellent, but you want to be really careful. These are not common, 
and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of these are turning up in the market today. I see them all the time. Um, it's a, the estimate on it, I think, is extremely reasonable, eight to twelve thousand dollars. If you've ever wanted to own a real one, this is one you might want to go after. I don't think you'd ever get tired of it because aesthetically it's so pretty. The, the potting, the color, the, the, everything about it, it sort of glows. It's a really nice example, really really sweet example. And then over here to the birdcage, the Burl Inlaid Zetan birdcage, and it's signed by um, uh, Jin Sun Wei. And uh, Jin Sun Wei was a this is a 20th century birdcage, uh, Republic period, but he worked in southern China, and he's considered to be probably I, I, I actually I read it again, it reinforced what I, I remember about this guy was he's supposed to be the the finest birdcage maker in China, and uh, he did these incredibly fine um, um, works in um, um, putting together these cages. And they're superbly well done, absolutely superb. Um, and it's got its porcelain um, feeding dishes and so forth in it. And as many of you know, you know, uh, keeping birds was a, a major hobby among the uh, among the literati classes and so forth. And uh, this fellow just made the finest of all the bird cages, just absolutely superb work. And uh, this one looks like it's in outstanding condition. Uh, I, I looked at it. I looked at it for quite a while, trying to find if there's anything spot any breaks or damage and it looks like it's lived very happily here's the plaque that goes with it with a signature on it and it looks like it's been living very happily in its lovely case for a number of years uh there's the inscription the the, the, the maker on the side and here it is there's the color this beautiful burl wood with zetan posts and as you know zetan is extremely rare it's got a big estimate 70 to 100 thousand dollars but if you go through and uh, check prices and go through auction records from Sotheby's and Christie's and Bonham's and uh, Guardian and so forth, you're going to find maybe two or three of these have sold in the last 20 years, if that many. They do not turn up often. Um, they're, they're sort of like family treasures in China. If you have one, boy, you don't want to sell it. And this is a beautiful one. So we'll see how, see how it does. It could do very, very well. And then last is this, one of my favorite things. I love Sung Heads. Um, and um, we, over the years, we talked about them. I remember there was a great one that turned up. Um, was it in the, maybe it was the Ellsworth collection. I forget. It was a lacquered uh, sung head. This is a polished lime, black limestone example. Beautifully detailed. Really, really lovely. Not a lot of history on it. They don't know much about it, apparently, where it came from, other than it was quiet. I think it says it was quiet in Hong Kong. Here's the back of it. Uh, absolutely, you know, looks authentic. Uh, from what I can see, uh, the stonework on it's excellent. It's 11 inches tall. It was acquired uh, re required in Hong Kong in the early 1990s. It's estimated at 80 to 120 thousand dollars, which is not at all unreasonable. Uh, these limestone heads like this do not turn up often, and this is a, a beautiful, beautiful example. The eyes, the way the nose is done, the lips, the the upper raised cheeks, and those great big earlobes draping down. And, and then the furrowed brow and all that. It's just a beautiful, beautiful example. Wonderfully polished, undisturbed surface from what I can see. Eighty dollars to $120,000. And uh, there's, a, there's a good lot essay in here, actually, um, uh, about these uh, Shakyamuni heads and so forth and how they turn up. And uh, very, very attractive. And those are the pieces I, saw, I went through in this one particular sale, the things that I liked the best. Um, some of the furniture was is, is nice. I didn't see any pieces of furniture that absolutely knocked me out, um, um, which is okay. Uh, there was some a lot of 18th and 19th century furniture. Uh, there's some early jades. If you're an early jade buyer, you can go through and pick it out. Uh, I've never found early uh, archaic jades uh, to be that exciting. So uh, I stick to the things that I'm, 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 I'm personally most interested in. I guess we all do that. But those are the things I found that I liked. And you go through and pick out the things that you like. Leave a comment, um, um, but check the catalog. We'll have a link to this auction at the bottom of this uh, underneath here um, when we post it. So you can go straight over to the sale if, you, if you're inspired and you want to take a look around. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. And uh, give us a thumbs up if you enjoy the videos. And uh, we'll be back with some more. We're gonna, there's a jade sale we're going to talk about. And uh, there's some stuff going on at Sotheby's and so forth. We'll get try to get to as many of them as we can. Maybe we'll have to combine a couple of sales. But uh, we'll start with this one. And uh, don't forget to check out the uh, the other one we did on the Marchant sale, which has got some really super superb things. Uh, At any rate, but these are, these are the items from this sale that I, I like the best. And uh, we go on from here. All right. See you all with a video later on this week. Bye-bye.